That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. Welcome to BS Beyond Stereotypes, a podcast about lawyers using their authentic voices to change the world. I find authenticity is is really the key for for squeezing out the best moments in your life. I, you know, when I have I think about Howard a lot when I go out in my career and I think about the love tough love that I got from my professors, but it was a combination of tough love with very high expectations and at the bottom of it strong belief that of course I could go do whatever I wanted to do and especially that I could go forth and achieve for the purpose of helping others. That was ground into me by by my in my education, especially at Howard. And that only there isn't anything more authentic than that. Welcome to BS Beyond Stereotypes. I'm your host, Merle Vaughn. Here to BS with me today is Yas- Yasmin Cater, whose, whose story I find fascinating and who will no doubt inspire all of you to embrace your authenticity. Hi, Yasmin. Hi, Merle. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes, yes. I'm so excited to talk to you. So I'm trying to well, first, let me, before I just start rambling, let me tell uh, tell our audience uh, who, a little bit about you and your background. Um, you attended Howard University undergrad, um, uh, attended Yale Law School, um, started out um, uh, clerking with the, the Court of Appeals, um, and then moved to um, the DOJ. Uh, uh, and, and then I, I think employment litigation section, um, and then became a public defender in DC and then a, a, a federal defender in New York. And then, um, you were the head of training for the federal defenders in Los Angeles. Um, uh, in 2019, uh, uh, left the government to found your own, uh, law firm with a partner. Um, and that's when we met through a mutual friend. Um, and then recently got a really, really exciting opportunity that we're going to talk about later with the ACLU. Did I, did I get that right? And please let me know what I messed up. You nailed it. <laughs> you nailed it. Thank you, Merle. You're welcome. I usually mess something up. So don't, you know, uh, I, I am open to, to your uh, letting me know if there's something else that you'd like to clarify or you'd like folks to know about your background. Nope, you've got it. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, tell me, um, well, first of all, I want to know where are you from? Because I see... You were in D.C., you're in New York, now you're in L.A. Um, what What's your background? I am from St. Paul, Minnesota, originally. and okay. um, I was going to guess the island, so I'm so wrong. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because considering your um, the title of your podcast, Beyond Stereotypes, often people, no one would imagine that I'm from the Midwest just because I've lived so far on the two coasts, but yeah, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from St. Paul and I grew up there. I went to central high school and then went from there to college. But, um, it is a place that I think is for people living on the coasts, um, a little bit misunderstood. First of all, people often say, are there any black people there? And I'm like, yes, there's black people there. We are there. (laughs) Um, and then there's also people who think that everybody is a musician um, because the black people they know from Minnesota is Prince and Prince, right. <laughs> right. And um, while I love music and have dabbled, I am not a musician. But yes, I'm from Minnesota, and I think it's also a place that has been certainly highlighted in the last year and a half with the tragedy that um, befell. Uh, the George Floyd when he was murdered by the police. So I think that 
now people have a little bit better understanding of both um, the demographics as well as the challenges that that city faces as, a lot, as well as the rest of uh, our cities in, in this country. Right. Is your family still there? Yep. My, my mother is still there, does not want to leave very proud to be from there. So, um, she is, she is still there. And I have a lot of friends from high school who I'm still in in close touch with. Okay, great. Well, I, uh, that is good to know. And I, you know, see you talking about stereotypes, you know, because I, um, I've been to, to, uh, Havana, Cuba a couple of times, you know, in the interim between the, they open opening it and closing it. And, that was the first time I met um, someone named Yasmin, um, uh-huh. and and with you know the spelling with the Y, and so I just assumed that you were probably from you know Cuba or the islands or something like that. Not St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so talk to me about you know what type of stereotypes other you know than there are no black folks you know uh-huh. did 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 you did that follow you to howard i mean how how was that for you going from from the midwest to to chocolate city it was wonderful and i have to say um you know one of the wonderful things about going to an hbcu and in particular howard university is just the diversity that's there. I mean, you have people from all over the world, uh, literally all over the world, all over the African diaspora. And so going to Howard University there, you know, I didn't face, I don't think a lot of um, stereotypes of assumptions that people made because there were so many people from everywhere. You know, you just, it was very cosmopolitan and um, it was a great experience. So, you know, for me, that was, it was eye opening. It was um, an extraordinary kind of diversity within the black community. Um, and it was just a, a wonderful environment for me to go to for, for the next step after leaving um, the Midwest. And then you went to Yale, which is um, <laughs> a lot different. I'm very aware of uh Yale because my daughter went there for undergrad, but how, how was that transition? That was, there were a lot of wonderful, positive things about it. And there were some challenges. And I I would say for me personally, going to that environment more than the different racial composition. And when I was there, it wasn't nearly as diverse as it is now. um, There was just kind of, the image or the stereotype I had of the institution being very elitist. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was almost like I needed to combat my own stereotype of the police um, and find out that, well, that certainly was an element of, of the institution. There was a lot more to be found and a lot more to, um, to, to change. And I worked really closely and intently with the school when I was there and since I've left on helping it open up and um, be, uh, I think, a a little bit more welcoming of a place for people from a background like mine. So I'm really glad that I was able to, to have that opportunity. But it was, you know, you can imagine going from, from an institution where your community is um, the majority to one where your community is the vast minority is, is, it's no joke. No, I'm I'm well aware of it. I actually grew up in Compton and went to through, all the way through high school in Compton, and then went to USC when I was 16. And it it is it it was a culture shock. It, yep. it was definitely a culture shock, and 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 you know difficult um, to get to to get used to. Um, you know, I'm glad I did it, but mm-hmm. it was not easy. Right. I, I, I think that having these different experiences, I'm really grateful for them. I'm really grateful that I went to my public high school, which was both racially and economically diverse. It was a majority black school, um, but it was also economically diverse. Um, and then going to Howard, which was just 
an international diversity experience, but, you know, within the African di- diaspora predominantly, and then going to, to Yale, you know, those are really different lenses. And I gained a lot from it. I really did. I have to say I'm lucky. Right. And so you went to Yale and then you decided to, you know, unlike a lot of us who go to <laughs> law school and we're like, you know, show me the money. Right. Uh, you decided to, 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 uh, go into government, you know, what, what caught, you know, how, how did you decide to make that choice? You know, it was, I was just drawn and, and I mean, in the summers, I did go to a couple of big firms and had a wonderful time, made a lot of money, ate a lot of great meals. <laughs> I know a lot of great shows you get to go. Yep, to. Yep. I got <laughs> wine and dine, but you know, when you, when it, for me, when it came to the substance of how I was going to be spending my time and my days, I was just drawn to the struggle and to wanting to be on the front line of that struggle. I clerked for the Honorable Damon J. Keith, who was one of the first African-American judges appointed to the federal bench. And he was also just a staunch supporter of the civil rights movement. Um, I was in Detroit, Michigan, you know, where there was such a amazing history of leaders in the movement. Um, but even before then I was really, you know, mentored by my professors at Howard, um, and my, my community where I came from in Minnesota about, don't forget where you came from. And, you know, it was just a very strong ethos of giving back. But I have to say, I never felt like I was doing some kind, I've never felt in my career that I'm doing some kind of, you know, charity work or, or, you know, work that is, should be something other than what is in my own interest and and passion. And so I feel just very, even though I might not have been paid a lot of money in my career, what I've received from the privilege of standing up for people who the world has turned against is immeasurable. It really is. That's amazing. And, you know, it's interesting. I guess some people, sometimes the, the, the universe conspires, right, to, to, mm-hmm. uh, for you because, you know, like I said earlier, in 2019, you left government and founded a firm um, that, you know, from, you know, that was doing well, um, you know, private practice doing well. And then you get this opportunity to do this amazing next uh, step in your career. Um, with the with the ACLU uh and so you know you're drawn back and you know I'm looking at the press release it you know you've been named as uh the the attorney to lead the Trone Center for Justice and Equality I just got goosebumps <laughs> um, and so you know do you do you just feel like this was just the the what you were meant for, you know, or, you know, cause you tried, you tried to do something else. I did. I know. I do feel a little bit like the universe conspired against me because I have to say founding my firm with my law partner, um, Christine Adams has been one of the most amazing, um, difficult, challenging and rewarding experiences I ever had. And even though it was short lived, Um, I gained so much from it. And I'll tell you, I wasn't looking to leave at all. I mean, Christine and I really built something we're both very committed to, which was an environment where women and people of color could really thrive in private practice. Um, We we care a lot about mentoring. We care a lot about um, lifting as we climb. And we, you know, we just jumped out there, as you remember, Merle, we didn't have a client between us. And we right. just jumped out there and said, let's see what happens. And we've been so fortunate that the firm has really um, been, it's been really successful. So I'm minding my business. Things are going well. We're working hard. And then I get this call um, encouraging me to apply for this position. And it really did feel like a, I, I just something I could never even imagine being considered for, for many reasons, but including that I live here on the left coast. Right. And so I don't think that that would have been something before all that we've learned about the efficacy of Zoom and the ability to 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 be um, in other places and still come together that I would have been had this opportunity to be considered for this. So I have to I mean, I am overwhelmed and 
thrilled and just, it does feel like a culmination of all these experiences I've had to have this opportunity to lead this amazing group of lawyers um, who are committed to racial justice and criminal legal reform and prison reform and, you know, ending capital punishment and fighting for the rights of those at Guantanamo Bay. You know, I get to work with them. Come on. That just, I mean, I just couldn't be more excited. And and I, I have to say, to work with this organization. I mean, this is a hundred-year-old civil rights, civil libertarian um, leader. And, you know, I think that there's a there's just so much work that the ACLU has done to fight for the Constitution in so many different um, lanes that I'm thrilled to be a part of that team. They are just some rock star warriors, and I am excited to join them. And so you're going to be leading how how, how many lawyers and, and also, you know, if we have any um, folks out there who are listening who might want to, you know, follow suit, get involved, you know, what are, talk to us about, you know, how folks can do that. Well, I'm so glad you asked. One of the things that makes the ACLU really unique is the affiliate structure. So I'm working with the national ACLU, but there are affiliates in every state. And so if people are interested, there's so many ways to get involved. And it doesn't just have to be lawyers. Um, you know, the ACLU is always looking for volunteers who want to get involved with um, helping to spread the news about what initiatives are being taken, about what um, needs there are to, to be involved in, in member education. Um, communications is a really strong, strong arm of the organization. So I would, if for people who are interested in getting involved, really look carefully at the robust website, um, both in terms of the national um, opportunities, but as well as the affiliate structure and, and getting involved locally. Because one of the things I'm learning is just how that positions this organization differently really than anyone else is that affiliate structure. That's how you're able to identify what is going on with our communities across the country in need of somebody to stand up for their constitutional rights is by being on the ground locally. So the, the you know, coordination of the affiliate structure with the national is huge. Um, so that's just, there's, you can sign up for the emails to stay informed and to take action to make sure that we're all fighting to protect everybody's rights. So this is this is a question that you know they would ask on CNN or something. What mm -hmm. what what do you hope to achieve in your first hundred days there? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> and and I mean the, the one of the things that's so interesting I think about coming into this role at this time is that there's. I'm not. I'm not coming into something that isn't up and running and, and thriving. I'm. I'm joining a, a thriving center that is really fighting so many fights on in in so many states on on all of these various issues. That in my first hundred days, in addition to learning more about the existing docket and what's going on, I'm just really thrilled about connecting also with other civil rights organizations to combine our force and power to, to fight for systemic equality. The ACLU has a systemic equality agenda, which is robust and real. And I am just very, very um, thrilled to be able to just dig into that and to figure out in ways to just expand what's already happening. So I think that that would be one of my first 100 days um, goals is really putting um, even more meat on the bone of that of that agenda. That sounds great, and and I I think you know getting back to stereotypes. I think one of the stereotypes that I've had, and and I'm sure others have had, is that the ACLU only uh, fights for people of color. And I've learned mm -hmm. recently that that is not the case. And sometimes some of the cases that they take on, I mean, you know, are are, are a little surprising to me. So, you know, can you, I mean, would you agree with that? And, and can you help us understand, you know, how to, how to reckon with that? 
Sure. And if I'm understanding you right, you're, you're, you're saying, why are they standing up for Nazis in the Klan? Is that fair? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's a great question. And I think a really important one. And, and the way that I um, have always appreciated the fact that that, that is one of the, um, one of the stances that the organization has taken traditionally is when I look at the principles of the law of, for example, what we're talking about is the First Amendment. Without the First Amendment, without the right to voice our opinions and be a meaningful contributor to democracy, um, we have nothing. And, and I think that it's really important when we think about this to look at the origins of the jurisprudence of the First Amendment and how it evolved and how much, first of all, the First Amendment is Black people's as much as anybody else's because it wouldn't apply to the states but for the 14th Amendment. And so we have us to thank for that. But the way that it was expanded in terms of the, the right to assemble and the rights of speech during the civil rights movement cannot be underestimated. We made that happen. That happened on our watch with our voice. You know, there's seminal cases from NAACP Legal Defense Fund during that era that ensured these freedoms for everybody. So when the ACLU stands up for those freedoms for groups that we abhor, okay, mm -hmm. it's to protect the right that we fought for and that we need to be able to contribute our voice to this democracy. So if that law is going to go, is going to be somehow compromised because of an unfair analysis of the group, meaning, oh boy, here comes the Klan. Well, we're going to deny this right because we don't like the Klan. You know, trust and believe they will turn around and do that to us and have and will. And so I think it's really important to understand the reason for that. But I think e equally important is to understand that that, you know, there's a perception when you when you stand up in a controversial case, you get a lot of press, but there's a lot of work being done every single day by the National ACLU, as well as all of the affiliates to keep protecting that right for everyone and vast, you know, many people who aren't as abhorrent as the Nazi party or the Klan or the Tiki Torch uh, right. <laughs> carriers, you know? So, so I think that, you know, we always have to look at this through the lens that you identified of what's on the surface and what is, you know, social media telling us and what is the, the big news versus what is the day-to-day -day grinded out work that's being done. Right. And, and, and it's also, you know, we have to keep in mind that the, that the precedent it, that that's being set right because if you set if you you know uh set a precedent uh that can be used against good later mm -hmm. <laughs> then then um you you uh set yourself up for failure exactly and we have to we have to protect and defend this constitution the is the constitution you know flawed absolutely but there are principles with those bill of rights that need to be protected, that are good, that are valuable, that are of our highest value and reflect what our nation should stand for. And we need to fight for those principles in sometimes contexts that we don't like, but fight for them nonetheless. So I know you're a, a trial lawyer. Do you think you'll get to argue in, for, in front of the Supreme Court or you leave, or are you going to leave that to your, your people? I will leave the Supreme Court practice to the experts, including the um, infamous David Cole, who is the national legal director and just a master at the Supreme Court. But I do hope to um, not get too rusty and be able to rock and roll in in other contexts and other and other in front of other types of uh, courts other than the Supremes. Cool, cool. So let's get back to to authenticity and stereotypes and 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 all of that. You know, you know what what do you feel makes you unique? Oh wow, I would say that for me, Merle, what we were talking about before of having this lens from so many different angles of living different places and having these experiences. Um, I think that, that that is something that, 
that gives me a different perspective. Um, you know, I defended kids and adults in DC at some of the apex of the war on drugs. I rep, I was in New York for nine 11. Um, and I saw what happened to, um, so many communities, including Muslim communities, post 9-11 in terms of just the atrocious prosecution um, uh, initiatives that were taken. I was there for stop and frisk and saw what happened to our black and brown communities through that pernicious, awful um, experiment. And then being here in LA, both under Obama and Trump, uh, the immigration policies, I've, you know, I've seen a lot. So I think that that's um, that gives me a unique perspective um, on 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 the world and on the work. But I will also say this, you know, I came from, uh, you know, a family that had a strong uh, educational past. Um, my mother was a newspaper reporter, you know, so a lot of exposure from that. I went to Howard. I went to Yale. You know, I had a very um, privileged life. Mm -hmm. And then when I became a public defender and I looked at life through the lens of what my clients were, were enduring from the just intersection of race and poverty, um, that, that makes me unique because I've had the privilege of earning the, you know, the trust and being able to stand up for people who, as I said, the world has turned against and seen the world through their eyes. And I think that that gives me a real unique lens on the world that I wouldn't have had were I not able to have the privilege of doing that work. That, that, that is um, commendable. Definitely. And, and I, I'm glad you use the word privilege because I think that, um, you know, we are privileged, you know, every, everything is relative. Right. And, 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 and we are privileged, but there's a, there's a difference um, privilege, the word privilege gets thrown around a lot these days. Um, and there's a difference between, you know, having privilege and recognizing it and, you know, and recognizing it through your lived experiences. And there's a and in actually using your privilege to, to hurt people. Sure. Like and people yeah, down. I, yeah. And I, I feel like the conversation that we that we're having around privilege is a really important one. I also think equally we need to make sure that it isn't one where there are people left with feelings of shame because that is just we don't have time for that. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, people have privilege. They didn't necessarily ask for it. You know, it's 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 something that is is inherited. And the question is not why do you have it? The question is, what are you going to do with it for good? Because we all can take our privilege and use it to fight for those who don't have it. You, you know, it's not just recognizing that you have the privilege. It's not just recognizing that others don't, but it's now that you have it, what are you going to do to marshal it to level the playing field? And that's what is exciting to me about the privilege conversation is the action item of it. What are we going to do to marshal that privilege to make the world a better place. And so you also mentioned um, what happened in 9-11 with, with, you know, our Muslim uh, brothers and sisters. And, and I was watching the news uh, yesterday and just, you know, really, really concerned about the women in Af Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts <laughs> about that? You know what what that shows me, Merle, is your fundamental understanding of how connected we are. And I think if there's one thing that we've learned, I hope, goodness, I hope, is just as a world and as 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 a humanity is we are inextricably intertwined with each other. You know, and that it so is so very true that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I mean, I do believe in the goodness of people in the, in the um, inherent camaraderie that we have um, and that we can foster. And, and so the fact that you're looking at that and your heart is going, there's my sister there and I'm so worried for her because her oppression is my oppression, right? right. Um, I don't know. I, I think that it is just vital for our country to be a leader 
in a moral voice of being able to adequately and effectively critique regimes that are oppressing women by talking about how we're fighting that oppression here ourselves. You know, I mean, there's, we're, we're, we're while this is going on in, 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 in Afghanistan, you know, women's rights to choose is being challenged right now, right. <laughs> you know, in that same, in that same front page that you were looking at, there's cases across the country and, and state legislatures that are threatening women's right and people's rights to choose and so I, I think that, that we need to be very concerned about our sisters in Afghanistan, as well as we are concerned about our sisters in Mississippi and in Texas and in other states where um, there is a real movement to really dehumanize and shackle women's rights to choose, that we, we can't let that happen. Because, you know, back to your point of stereotypes, that's a Black woman's issue as well. It's not... It is a woman of color's issue very much. It's not just a white woman's issue, right? And I think a lot of times people look at the women's movement as something other than being encompassing of all of us. Right, right. Well, and and I know, you know, what I do um, in diversity recruiting, one of the things that that I try to remind clients about is, and, and now after, you know, what has happened over the last year or so with the murder of George Floyd and, and the civil unrest that has come out of that, a lot of clients have uh, actually come to me and said, okay, we, we, we're we really good on women. <laughs> you know, we're really right. good on women. Uh, we, you know, but, you know, we're really bad on people of color. And, and they, they've realized that it was much easier to do, you know, the, the women thing, um, uh, uh, irrespective of whether or not that included, you know, women of color. And, and, and so, you know, I'm just hoping that this recognition uh, continues and that this is a, a, a movement and not a moment. I do too. And one of the things I've done a lot of DE&I consulting as well um, in, in private practice. And what I'm seeing is a recognition, and this is what excites me, a recognition on the, on the part of, of leaders in, in, in business of the value of diversity in terms of the product. When right. you have different view perspectives and different points of view, and you're challenged on what you want to do, um, and challenged on your concepts and challenged on your beliefs and challenged on just your mode of thinking, it forces a refining of that mode of thinking and it forces a refining of the process. And then what you get at the end is a better product, is a better result. And that what is what I am very excited about when I think of this um, kind of diversity motivation is sure there's a you know, we want to rectify the past. We don't like this, you know, inequity, but as important is, and we really need these different perspectives. We don't want to sit in our silos. That's what is inspiring to me. And and that's where I'm hoping the conversation continues to grow. Yeah, me too. Here, here. So, so, you know, you talked about what makes you unique. Um, And, you know, when you, you know, that, so that, that's your authentic self, right? And, have you have you ever felt like in your career that you could not be your authentic self? Mm, that's a great great question. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think there have you know for all of us there are times when you're working in an environment that isn't um, as diverse as it can or should be, where you have to, you know, learn how to, as they say, wear the mask, Um, you, you know, code switch, all of those things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But the place that I think of it the most is when I think about the courtroom and I think about standing up for my clients and I think about sentencing hearings when there's countless of them where I'm representing somebody who grew up with subpar education, um, just chaotic family lives, um, you know, little to no realistic opportunity, insecure housing situations, 
you know, just every, everything that could um, go wrong or could be systemically challenging happened to these people, you know, usually young majority, young men of color, but a fair amount of young women of color as well. And having a judge sit there and look, judge my client by a standard of their own um, bias. Of, yeah, of their own bias and their own privilege and and shame the client and point the finger and wa- wag the finger at the client and say, I can't believe you do this. And if you do this again, you know, we're going to have to throw the book at you and you're so fortunate and you're so lucky I'm giving you this break or often, you know, we're going to be sending you, we're throwing the book at you because of your moral failures without an analysis of when, you know, of what really is going on in terms of opportunity and the lack thereof. And I have to jump on that same bandwagon because I'm fighting for that client and not be my authentic self and say, who are you judge to judge? (laughs) But instead say your honor, absolutely a hundred percent. We will never do this again. We've learned our lesson. Thank you so, you know, so much for your understanding, (laughs) you know, so there's nothing authentic in that, but that's strategy. And that's what I have to do for my client. Right. So that for me was the time that I felt the most. um, And it wasn't just one time it's, you know, a 23 year career as a defender, that is something that, that, that I had to learn how to keep myself in check and my opinions in check and fight for what was going to be the best thing for that individual in that moment. And that, you know, and that, that's, that's the hardest part is the, especially because some of it is cultural, right? You know, the way you respond um, to, to things has a lot to do with the environment that you grew up in and, and, you know, how you were uh, uh, conditioned um, uh, and being able to, 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 to pull that off uh, takes, it takes a lot. Well, I think that, that it's for me, I think about, especially after having my own children, you know, everything that goes into providing people with as much nurturing and opportunity and exposure that they can reach their full human potential. And I had a, I, one of the cases I, I'll never forget, I had a client who had been abandoned, really abandoned by his, his, his family and raised by some people, and I say raised in quotes, who had him working as a lookout for drug dealing when he was really eight started at eight and just, you know, got involved in the, the, the neglect system and then the delinquency system and, you know, just the, the parade of horribles. Right. And I remember just asking him, and I was younger, I was in my late twenties, but I remember asking him, what did you eat? Cause I was trying to put together what his life was like, you know, what do you eat? What did he was a kid when I was representing him? He was in his, like 15 years old. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, you know, 7-Eleven and McDonald's. And I said, well, when, did, when, when do you eat a real meal? When does somebody cook for you? And he was not singing a sad song. He was like, Miss Cater, why are you asking me these questions? Right, right. But, but he's like, you know, Christmas or, or Easter. And I'll never forget that, Merle, because I was sitting there and I'm thinking about this kid, while he's developing physiologically, right, is eating the worst food a person could eat not just one meal, not just two meals, but every meal and not just one day, just not two days, but the vast majority of days. Right. And I don't know if you remember that documentary, Super Size Me, where uh, the Michael, um, what's his name? Did it? I, yeah. And he was suffering from liver damage from 30 days of eating McDonald's, mm, mm-hmm. a grown man. And I'm thinking, what is going, what are we, this is poison. This is just one little insight into the poison that this child was enduring. And that's just food. Who's tucking him in at night? Who was reading him stories? Who was making sure he got to baseball practice? He didn't go to baseball right. practice. He didn't go to football practice. He didn't, nobody was doing those things. Nobody was thinking about 
his social development, who, what teachers were nurturing him when those teachers were overwhelmed with 45 children in the class, right. you know, there just was no infrastructure. And then I contrast it to my kids as I'm sitting there, you know, celebrating the third bite of organic broccoli, you know, right. I mean? right. you know making sure that they're going to, um, you know, soccer practice and, getting their tutoring um, and, and support that they need academically, you know, in, in these wonderful environments. And, and you just look at that. That's the lens through which I see this, this kind of fallacy of choice or decision-making that, that we put upon people when they make uh, mistakes or take turns that we wish they hadn't. I mean, we need to be really honest about what the foundations are, what foundations are lacking and what, what quote choice is there really? Yep. Yep. You're, you're absolutely right. So what words of encouragement or, or advice do you have for others about embrace, uh, embracing their authentic selves? Um, or do you think that, you know, they should be, you know, just open to doing whatever you need to do uh, in the moment? Well, I think, I'm so, that's a great question. I, I think for me, um, and I think about when you and I met Merle and, and, and you're going to get, I have found, I think about that moment and how encouraging you were to me and how open you were with me. And you were saying, you didn't look at me and say, how are you going to start a law firm? You and your, your law partner don't have a client between you. <laughs> what are you doing? I mean, how are you going to jump out of a stable job and go in here and just hang up a shingle that, you know, no, what you said is absolutely. I will be there for you. I will give you these connections, those connections. I will encourage you in this way. I will look at your website data. I will tell you what to tweak. You mentored me. And you helped me. And the only reason for that is because I showed up authentically to you. Right. I showed up with my belly up and said, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> I have this. I have that. And if I hadn't done that, and if I hadn't shown up authentically, you wouldn't have been in a position to be as wonderful and gracious and fantastic as you were because you wouldn't have known what I needed. So I think my advice is to be real in safe in spaces where you can be and should be. Um, and then, you know, and, and, and engage the situation. But I find authenticity is, is really the key for, for squeezing out the best moments in your life. I, you know, when I have, I think about Howard a lot when I go out in my career and I think about the love tough love that I got from my professors, but it was a combination of tough love with very high expectations. And at the bottom of it, strong belief that of course I could go do whatever I wanted to do. And especially that I could go forth and achieve for the purpose of helping others. That was ground into me by, by my, in my education, especially at Howard. And that only, there isn't anything more authentic than that. Right. right. Isn't anything more real, more purposeful. And so I I kind of pair authenticity with the concept of 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 purpose. Yep. And um and I see them inextricably intertwined. Um and I don't think you can achieve or identify what your purpose is if you're not being real about who you are and what moves you. You know, and, and if you're moved by um, fighting for people who are dispossessed, if you're moved by building a business that, you know, um, and, and forging a path that others haven't, haven't been able to before you, if you're moved by lifting up your climb, if you're moved by creating um, a nurturing and amazing home, whatever you're moved by, it, I don't think you can achieve the, um, or I really identify what you're moved by if you're not being authentic in the process. I, I agree. It's funny. You, you mentioned tough love too. My, my Instagram, uh, name is tough love with mama Merle. <laughs> there you go. And that's um, why I, 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 and that's, I, that's what you gave me too, Merle. I don't know if you remember, but you were so real with me 
and in, equally inspiring and also told me like, you need to change this, 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 and go <laughs> after this, 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 this. And, um, it, and I'm grateful to you for that. I really am. You are, to me, really the embodiment of somebody who lifts as you climb. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for that. So let me, we, we, we know that, you know, we know your, uh, your educational credentials. We know where you're from. Uh, we know what you're doing, what you've done and what, what in professionally and what you're doing. We know that you're a woman who's done it and has kids. So, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're doing it all. So I know you're, you're probably exhausted um and and in need of meditation a lot <laughs> but what do you what do you do for fun oh it's all about you know i have a lot of fun with my kids um it i really love unscheduled downtime where we can just have meandering conversations and 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 just play with our dog but outside of my family which is a lot of fun, I have to say, including my husband, who is a whole lot of fun. Um, I love to be with my girls. Um, tomorrow night, we're celebrating two friends' birthdays, and I can't wait. Nice. And um, and I think for me, connecting with connecting with my sister friends is just one of the greatest um, joys that I have. I also love, um, you know, I. I I, I need for both stress release as well as for, um, for just joy. I love to play tennis. I'm not very good, but I love to play tennis. Oh, I was a tennis player. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you know, it just whatever kind of outdoor activities I can get in, I, I, I like to do, but, um, you know, I like to read and I love music. I, maybe I am a real Minnesotan cause that yeah. is my, that is my happy place is, you know, some real good, you know, long, I have all my, put my headphones on and just bop. <laughs> well, you know, and it's, it's interesting because we've had several, um, we've had several interviews where the lawyers on the, uh, that were interviewing, it turns out that they're, they're uh, uh, musicians or have something, a lot of lawyers have a, yeah. a big interest in music, which is interesting. Yeah. I think it's, it's, I think it kind of, really dovetails with what music does to your brain and how it teaches you to, um, you know, when you, especially when you play music, you know, just there's so much a combination of creativity and logic at the same time, right. that, you know, when you can bring that uh, same combination to the law, that's when people are really successful. Well, you know what, you have given us so much of your, de- your uh, morning and I really appreciate it. And just want to ask you, do you have like one, like final bit of, of advice or something that you'd like to share before you, you know, people have to, you know, you're going to be a, a big deal. So I think that oh, people, come on. People, people need to listen to this before you take over that, that, <laughs> that gig on September 15th. What, what, what can you share with us as a parting, um, parting uh words i will say that especially for lawyers but for any any professionals um going back to the point that frankly you were making about our connectedness in humanity and ensuring that whatever you do that you find whether you're you're working in public interest or not that you find a time to stand up and fight for people who don't have the advantages that you have is a real um, recipe for living um, and having a career and a life of deep, deep meaning and satisfaction. So find a, a way, if it's through a pro bono case, if it's through a volunteer activity, something that will give you that perspective and that privilege of, of being able to help others. It, there's nothing, I think more meaningful or, um, um, or nothing that will, will give you as much back as you are and more than what you're giving to the, giving to the world. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, Yasmin, thanks for being here to BS with me today. We will be (laughs) following you, uh, uh, at the, uh, the ACLU. So proud of you, my girl. And, um, thank you. 
thank you, Merle. I will talk to you soon. You take care. Yeah. And thanks to everyone for listening until the next episode. Remember that everybody is different and different is good. Amen. Talk to you later. Hit it. That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay. Now from the beginning. We hope you enjoyed the stories shared in today's episode of BS, Beyond Stereotypes. Join us next time when another authentic personality unleashes their uniqueness on the world.